neutrinos, uh, getting to the heart of them. There's a bit of a uh, pun intended in the title. The experiments uh, I will describe in great detail is called Quarry. Quarry is Italian for heart. Um, so, uh, and so this is the picture of one of the towers. So, uh, the main motivation is to study neutrinos. The main motivation is to try to understand this uh, very feebly interacting particles. And what we mostly know about neutrinos uh, so far comes from the phenomenon known as uh, neutrino oscillations. Those of you who were here last week, um, those of you who were uh, reading the news uh, three weeks ago would certainly remember that title. The phenomenon describes a change in the properties of neutrinos, or in fact, the change in their type as neutrinos propagate from their source uh, to the detector. And the best way to look at that, the best way to demonstrate that, was uh, the measurement done by Kamland experiment in Japan, which looked at the probability for neutrinos uh, to continue, for neutrinos produced in a nuclear reactor in Japan, somewhere on the coast uh, of Japan, um, and to look at their propagation and their so-called survival probability as they propagate forward over some distance of 100 kilometers or so from the coast of Japan to the middle of Japan to the detector in Kamioka mine called Kamlan. Uh, Kamlan was led by uh, Stuart Friedman, who unfortunately passed away unexpectedly in 2012. Um, otherwise, uh, he would have celebrated uh, probably the accomplishments of these experiments a uh, study neutrinos is rewarding, both figuratively and quite literally. Uh, the uh, concept, the phenomenon of neutrino uh, oscillations has been awarded Nobel Prize uh, this year to Kajita and McDonald from uh, Super Kamiokande and uh, Snow experiments. And of course, last week, the breakthrough prize was awarded to five experiments who have studied the concept of neutrino oscillation in great detail. Uh, so that Snow, Super K, Kamland, T2K, and Dia Bay. And of course, Berkeley has played an important role in uh, several of these experiments. In fact, uh, among uh, people on stage or among people in the audience, uh, Berkeley group has made seminal contributions to Snow, Kamland, and Dia Bay at least, so three out of five. So this phenomenon is now well understood. In fact, uh, the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations can be easiest uh, to describe as the beating effect. Uh, if you imagine a pair of uh, coupled oscillators, uh, for example, a pair of oscillators coupled through a string, you can start the oscillation process. You can uh, you know, kick the green pendulum and over time, uh, it will transform, transfer energy to the red oscillator and, ba and back. So this transfer of energy, this coupling effect, uh, is very similar to the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. In mechanics, you learn about two eigenway modes of this process. Um, and uh, that's very similar to what happens in neutrinos. Except uh, the phenomenon of neutrino oscillation is a similar effect, it's a quantum mechanical effect of transforming or rotating uh, the axis of the two neutrino states that we uh, la can label as nu1 and nu2. These are the states that have a definite mass or have definite energy in uh, mechanical Lagrangian. Um, that uh, set of states in nature is represented by a uh, set of particles that participate in the weak interaction so we would call them new electron and new muon. And so both of these set of states can be rotated relative to each other by uh, an arbitrary angle. And so uh, the physical states that we observe then become linear uh, superpositions of the states with a definite mass. And since neutrinos have mass, they propagate through space with the speed slightly smaller than the speed of light. And over time, the difference in the propagation speed can uh, build up a phase shift between these two states. And therefore, what you observe 
uh, at some later time uh, or at a distance from a source can be a different combination of the two mass states from which you started. So uh, this quantum mechanical phenomenon, this beating that we measure now on uh, scales of hundreds of kilometers, an example of the Kamland experiment or even sometimes thousands of kilometers, is an example of quantum oscillations, quantum beating effect uh, on macroscopic states. This is the only uh, perhaps system in nature where we can study quantum mechanics on the scales of kilometers. And so uh, if we actually mathematically derive the uh, survival probability for these neutrino states, the probability depends on the difference in mass uh, of the two neutrino eigenstates. And so the fact that there has to be a mass difference means that at least one of the neutrinos has to have non-zero mass. So this we now uh, know that we know that there are three generations of neutrinos. We call them electron, muon, and tau neutrino. Uh, that uh, are, can be represented by mass eigenstates and uh, being somewhat unimaginative, physicists call them mu1, mu2, and mu3. So the fact that these states have a mass means that we can uh, look in the field theory for clues how this mass came about. In fact, until uh, about 20 years ago, uh, particle physicists believed that neutrinos were massless states. And the standard model was very nicely written in terms of the massless neutrino states. The standard model describes the Higgs mechanism of generating fermion masses. And the idea that uh, also received the Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago is relatively simple. Uh, you can imagine vacuum field with a field uh, known as the Higgs field and the particles propagating through this vacuum would interact with this field. And the drag, the experience, uh, would be viewed by us as a mass of what nominally would have been a massless particle. So in the standard model, it describes this, whereas uh, in the standard model, photons and neutrinos don't experience any interactions and therefore are massless. And all other fermions uh, achieve a mass through the interaction with this field. Now, since we now know that neutrinos uh, have a mass, we have to modify this description. And there are two ways to modify this description. One is to assume that neutrinos, just like any other fermions, interact with the Higgs field and acquire a non-zero mass. This is the simplest description. However, this description is a little bit strange in that in addition to describing the mass of the particles, we have to somehow explain the fact that neutrinos are very light particles. They're so light, we thought of them as massless uh, until very recently. Their masses are several orders of magnitude smaller than the mass of all other fundamental fermions. So somehow, if we describe neutrinos as so-called Dirac particles, we have to explain why neutrinos are so feebly, so weakly interacting with the Higgs field. There's another potential, there's another potentially a more appealing uh, description of the mass mechanism is to assume that neutrinos are special and unlike any other fermions can be their own antiparticles or a particle known as left-handed Majorana fermion. Uh, that coupled to another mechanism called the seesaw mechanism. Um, I, I apologize for some issues with the animation. A uh, mechanism called the CISO mechanism, where the mass of the light neutrinos is determined by a mass of a heavy particle created early in the Big Bang, a heavy neutrino, where we describe neutrino states as a pair of very heavy object and very light object, and then the mass of the very heavy object determines the mass of the very light neutrino. So the heavier the uh, fundamental Majorana neutrino is, the lighter the neutrino we observe in our world would be so-called the seesaw. As this particle goes down, uh, mass of this particle goes up and vice versa. So this is an appealing uh, description. Uh, it's an appealing description because it doesn't, uh, it's quite naturally, it uh, allows us to explain why neutrinos we observe now are so light. However, this is not a Higgs mechanism. So uh, this description requires some kind of a new physics and quite likely even if neutrinos turned out to be standard Dirac particles, assigning masses to them would require some kind of a new physics. So studying this phenomenon is uh, quite interesting. 
In fact, in uh, neutrino physics, we know at least three fundamental families of neutrinos exist. And again, we label them either neutrino one, two, and three, or we can label them by particles they produce when they interact with matter. And so we would call them electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And these are all linear superposition of the mass eigenstates and vice versa. So uh, oscillation experiments so far have measured with high precision differences between the neutrino mass states. We know the difference between sec first and second generation. We know the different mass difference between the second and third generation. What we don't know are how far away from zero the lightest neutrino sits. We don't know the absolute mass of the neutrino. We also don't know how these masses are arranged in nature. It can be, since we only measure differences of masses, we can arrange these mass differences in this way, and it's called normal, where the first neutrino generation is lightest, and this is similar to how a first charge lepton generation electron uh, has the lowest mass. Or the uh, mass differences could be flipped on its head, and this is known as so-called inverted hierarchy. So uh, we would like to actually understand how nature works, and in fact, some reasons uh, to prefer uh, in certain parts of astrophysics this arrangement. Um, however, we'll be unbiased and we'll try to measure this arrangement in the next five or 10 years in the neutrino oscillation experiments. So the picture of neutrino mixing is currently described by three mixing angles, and these are understood as Euler rotation angles in the three-dimensional space a complex phase which can be responsible for differences between the interaction of neutrinos and interaction of antineutrinos. Two mass differences and then the arrangement of this mass difference is known as the hierarchy. So uh, neutrinos are, uh, neutrino physics is full of surprises, full of questions. Uh, the most interesting question is in fact whether neutrinos and antineutrinos behave as the same identical particle and whether they interact in the same way uh, with matter. Uh, this is a uh, question uh, understood as the lepton number conservation. We would like to know whether neutrinos and antineutrinos behave the same way, whether neutrinos and antineutrinos can be the same particle, and if they are the same particle, then the uh, quantity known as lepton number would not be a, quantity, a conserved quantity in nature. We would like to know how massive the light neutrino is. We would like to know how masses are arranged and whether there is a matter-antimatter asymmetry in the neutrinos uh, that can potentially explain how matter and antimatter uh, asymmetry was built up in the early universe. So these questions will drive the fundamental neutrino physics for the next decade or so. So just as an aside for undergraduates in the audience, let me actually describe a concept known as helicity which is important for the description of the neutrinos and antineutrino states. Um, we describe uh, weak interactions and we describe uh, the way electrons, muons, tau, leptons, and quarks interact with uh, weak uh, gauge bosons using the concept known as helicity. And this helicity describes the projection of angular momentum of the spin of the particle onto its direction of motion, where by right-handed, particles, we mean particles whose spin points along the direction of motion, and left-handed particles is such where the direction of motion, where the spin points opposite direction of motion. So uh, weak interactions describe interaction of left-handed fields with the electroweak uh, fields, but it turns out the concept of left and right-handed is, is actually relative. But you can imagine that if you start with a right-handed particle, you can accelerate past this uh, massive particle, look back at it, and what you would see is the particle that travels away from you in the opposite direction, but whose spin is still pointing in the same direction. So you can ultimately convert what to you appears to be right-handed particle into left-handed particle. So uh, if particles has mass, then the concept of left or right-handed field becomes relative, and so you have to somehow introduce left-handed fields and right-handed fields, both types of fields, into your theory. So uh, this is also where lepton, uh, concept of lepton number uh, comes in. Neutrino is uh, the only fundamental fermion with zero charge. 
uh, it can, in theory, potentially it can be its own antiparticle, unlike electron that cannot be its own antiparticle due to the known conservation law, known conservation of electrical charge. Uh, we also know experimentally that neutrinos and antineutrinos behave differently. Ray Davis uh, uh, did an experiment with the chlorine, with uh, cleaning fluid, where he looked at whether neutrinos from the sun interacted with chlorine, the answer was yes. And then he looked at the antineutrinos produced by reactors interacting with chlorine and saw that there was uh, virtually no interaction. So uh, it was understood that uh, antineutrinos and neutrinos interact with matter differently. And so we can identify neutrinos and antineutrinos by the charge of the charged particle, by the charge of the lepton they produce. If neutrino comes in, interacts with medium, and the electron pops out, we would call this particle neutrino. If another object comes in and positron comes out, we would call this particle antineutrino, and the bar here probably isn't visible very well for you, unfortunately. So uh, the fact that the neutrino uh, is always associated with an electron and antineutrino is always associated with a positron allows us to introduce a charge, an effective charge, and we call it lepton number. So we'll assign a lepton number of plus one to particles, lepton number of minus one to antiparticles. Uh, we also know, however, that uh, the concept of helicity, or actually in field theory, it's a concept of a related concept of chirality, also plays an important role. We know that weak interactions only interact with left-handed fields and not right-handed fields. So uh, somehow perhaps these uh, issues, the uh, issues that there's uh, neutrino and antineutrino and left-handed and right-handed fields, maybe perhaps these issues can be related. So there are two ways to describe, I apologize, two ways to describe neutrino fields. We can describe neutrino fields as normal fermions and we can describe neutrino fields in terms of four fundamental fields. Left-handed neutrino field and a right-handed neutrino field, left-handed antineutrino field and a right-handed right -handed antineutrino field and left-handed um, antineutrino field. Uh, these uh, four different components of the neutrino wave function can be transformed into each other either by boosts, by accelerating uh, the frame or by uh, changing uh, charge uh, of the part of the field, uh, time reversal and space reversal symmetry, so-called CPT symmetry. So uh, this is the description of Dirac fields that has four components, two of them, left-handed neutrino and the right-hand antineutrino interact using weak interactions and the two other components don't. So this description uh, is the same as the description of the electrons, but then it begs the question as to why these two components of the wave function don't have any interactions at all in the standard model exist at all. So a more economical description is to describe the neutrinos as so-called Majorana fermions, where there are only two parts of the wave function, left-handed neutrino and the right-handed neutrino. When the neutrino is right-handed, it looks to us like an antineutrino, interacts producing positrons, and when neutrino is in left-handed state, it produces electrons when it interacts with matter. So much more economical description. Independently of which description nature uh, prefers, uh, either description requires some modifications of the standard model of particle theory. And the reason for that is that if neutrinos turned out to be Dirac particles, that means that the lepton number, this number that we've introduced here, is actually a conserved quantity of nature. Whenever a neutrino comes in, which has the lepton number of one, a electron has to come out from the interaction, which also has a lepton number of plus one. So if lepton number is a conserved quantity of nature, field theory tells us there has to be some fundamental symmetry that is associated with that conserved quantity. Standard model does know what theory would uh, describe that uh, lepton number conservation. And so we have to somehow perhaps invent a new theory and maybe it points us to some fundamental high energy interaction um, that has to be associated with the symmetry. If neutrinos are Majorana particles, they are unique, uh, they would be unique in nature. Uh, their mass mechanism cannot be described by the standard uh, Higgs mechanism, and so introduction of uh, Majorana neutrinos 
also uh, require some modification of the particle theory. So pretty much no matter what you do, no matter what we discover about neutrinos, has to tell us something new about nature. So one way to study these properties of these particles, and in fact, one way to answer the question whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana, is to study a rare nuclear process known as neutrinoless double beta decay. And the concept here is the following. Uh, we can look at a set of nuclei in which a standard beta decay, where one neutron decays into proton with the emission of electron and uh, antineutrino is energetically forbidden. In those nuclei, a process where two neutrons decay simultaneously, producing two electrons and two antineutrinos may be allowed. And there are about a dozen nuclei where that process happens. They typically have an even number of neutrons and even number of protons in a nuclear shell. So uh, this process, so-called two-electron, uh, two-electron double beta decay has been observed in nature in about a dozen isotopes, either directly or by radiochemical means. However, if neutrinos are their own antiparticles, then one can effectively convert a neutrino into an antineutrino uh, inside the nucleus and annihilate them against each other. So this would be the process drawn on the right-hand side where one starts with no electrons on the left, with two neutrons, produces two protons in the reaction, and two electrons. This is a fundamentally new process. It uh, violates lepton number. There are no electrons on the left side, and there would be two electrons on the right-hand side. Uh, so this would uh, manifest, the observation of this process would manifestly tell us that lepton number is not a conserved quantity of nature. The way to look for this process is to look at the energy spectrum of two emitted electrons. And if uh, the electrons, uh, if only two electrons are produced in this process and no neutrinos, one can, uh, the sum of two electron energy would produce a peak near the endpoint of a continuous energy spectrum produced by a well understood standard model process of two neutrino double beta decay. So uh, the name of the game then is to look for a peak at the end of the very long continuous energy spectrum that characterizes standard beta decay. This process is extremely slow. In fact, uh, they, uh, we look for lifetimes on the order of 10 to the 24, 10 to the 25 years. Um, you know, some graduate students complain they're so slow, the process is so slow, it takes them a while to graduate. One of those graduate students is sitting in the audience. Uh, so uh, it takes patience, it takes a uh, great care in the designing of experiments to look for uh, such rare events. However, should we observe the neutrino's double beta decay, it would immediately tell us that neutrino is a Majorana particle, that it's its own antiparticle. It would tell us that lepton number is not a conserved quantity in nature. And so it perhaps would tell us something about uh, interactions uh, at very early in the universe. And also, as it turns out, the rate of this process is sensitive to so-called effective neutrino mass, which is a linear combination of all neutrino masses in nature multiplied by a coefficient that relates neutrino masses and flavor eigenstates. So uh, in this field, it's uh, traditional to plot sensitivity of experiments in this uh, colorful so-called lobster plot. It's called the lobster because it sort of looks like a claw of a lobster, I suppose. Um, so this uh, linear combination of neutrino masses, the effective Majorana neutrino masses shown on the vertical scale, and the mass of the lightest neutrino that may be electron type or may be a tau type is shown on the horizontal scale. So as it turns out, some experiments are sensitive primarily to the horizontal scale. For example, there is an experiment in Germany called Katrin that in the next five or ten years may be able to measure the mass of the lightest neutrino mass to the precision of about 200 milli electron volts. So they will be sitting here somewhere. Neutrinoless double beta decay experiments measure this quantity. And so we can actually separate the two regions of this parameter space. If neutrino hierarchy is inverted, then there's a minimum of the effective neutrino mass. And so the next generation experiments that are actually sensitive to values of the effective neutrino mass in the range of about 50 to 100 electron, milli electron volts might be able to observe it unambiguously. And if the neutrino hierarchy is normal, then there is a uh, significantly smaller 
a set of uh, effective neutrino masses that would have to be observable in the experiments. So the name of the game uh, in this experiment is to look for a peak uh, at the uh, highest possible energy above or at the end point of the continuum spectrum from the two neutrino double beta decay. Um, experimentally, we observe the decay rate, or we hope to observe the process and measure its decay rate. And this decay rate depends on the amount number of uh, quantities uh, that we either understand or can compute. It's a second order weak interaction process, so it depends on the Fermi constant squared, and that's why the process is so slow. Uh, the second factor here is a phase space. Uh, it's uh, the number of final states available to the process. And that scales as the fifth power of energy transfer or mass difference between the two nuclei. And so one tends to choose nuclei where this uh, factor Q, the energy transfer, is large, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5 MeV or more. Then there's the parameter that actually is very difficult to compute. It's called nuclear matrix element. That's where most of the uncertainty in the interpretation of the experiment will show up. And then the entire rate is proportional to the square of the effective neutrino mass. So experiments tend to use nuclei isotopes with a large Q so that the rate of this process is as high as possible to satisfy impatient graduate students. Uh, and we are trying to express our sensitivity in terms of our sensitivity to this effective neutrino mass. Experimentally, however, uh, we can express this rate of this process in terms of measurable numbers of events. And this is where uh, it's clear that these experiments require patience and ingenuity. If you're looking for half-life of about 5 times 10 to the 25 years, we would ex expect in an experiment of the size of about one ton to observe about 100 events. Well, that's a reasonable quantity to shoot for. However, uh, if you build an experiment that's sensitive to the uh, half-life rate of about half factor of 100 larger, five times 10 to 27 years, we would expect to see roughly one event per ton of the isotope per year. So uh, if you have 10 graduate students on your experiment and you run for 10 years, each of them can actually study a single event in great detail. So uh, yes, this uh, you know, requires patience. Um, experimentally, the sensitivity is what the number that we want to actually determine uh, depends on the mass of the experiment, the mass of the isotope, depends on the amount of time uh, you allocate to your graduate students before their graduation, uh, and it uh, depends on the number of background events. And if the experiment isn't background free, if it's background limited, then the sensitivity scale is the square root of time. If the experiment is clean and no, with no background, it, the sensitivity scales linearly with time. That's certainly better. And so we are trying to design experiments that are operating in this regime. Um, also, as I mentioned, there are about a dozen isotopes in which this process can be observed. Uh, about six of them, or whatever, seven of them, are shown here, and we can express experimental sensitivity in terms of this figure of merit, uh, which is the uh, double beta decay rate divided by the neutrino mass. So the experiments tend to maximize this rate as much as possible, and you can see that most of the isotopes have the figure of merit that at least on the log scale are roughly equivalent to each other. There's no, so there's no real uh, preference for one isotope over another. However, another important parameter is how frequently you can find a particular isotope in nature. Uh, three isotopes are most commonly used, xenon-136, germanium-76, and tellurium-130 here. Out of those, tellurium-130 is an isotope that, about, that occurs in nature most often. In fact, about 34% of natural tellurium turns out to be in the right isotope uh, tellurium-130. Whereas the rest of the isotopes, xenon-136, and germanium-76 have a relatively low natural abundance, and so one has to uh, use a process of enrichment, similar to enrichment uh, used for nuclear weapons, to enhance the amount of material in your experimental sample. There is only one place in the world that does enrichment of materials at the scales. This is my home country. Uh, it's somewhat politically challenging these days to collaborate with that country. Uh, and so it's sometimes uh, advantageous to use isotopes that don't require expensive isotopic enrichment. 
There's a great number of experiments that actually look for this process in the world, uh, about a dozen or so. In fact, Berkeley uh, has a hand in about six of them. Um, the, uh, and they all use different technologies. For example, for very large liquid scintillator detectors like Kamland and Snow Plus, to uh, cold ionization experiments called Mayara, for example, an experiment called Mayarana, to an experiment that I will tell you about called Quarry. The thing to point out on this graph, this was taken from a uh, review done recently by Nuclear uh, Science Advisory Committee, uh, is to point out that most of these experiments are either already taken data, we are here sitting at the end of 2015, or soon we'll start operating. So the next few years will be very exciting in this field where we'll take, we'll see data from about a dozen uh, different experiments. And as I said, Berkeley has a hand in about six of them. So the current generation of experiments, so the, part of the experiments that have already operated, are sensitive to the neutrino masses of about 200 million electron volts and larger. Experiments that are just coming up online now, in the next few years, will be sensitive to the neutrino masses in the range of about 50 to 200 milli electron volts. Uh, they have isotopic masses of about 100 kilograms. And then in the relatively further future, we hope to build experiments with about a ton of the isotope to probe this inverted hierarchy completely. And if you are allowed to dream by our funding agencies, then hopefully at some point in the future, we'll be able to figure out how to put 10 tons or more of the isotope into an experiment. So uh, let me describe you the coldest cubic meter in the universe, Quarry. Uh, Quarry is an example of an experiment where, for practical reasons, we combine a source of the isotope and the detector in a single volume. Uh, it's much easier to build an experiment of about 100 kilograms to a ton scale where you don't have to separate the isotopes from the rest of the detector. So Quarry is a cryogenic experiment where we operate uh, crystals of tellurium dioxide about two inches on the side, five centimeters on the side. We equip these crystals to with a temperature sensor, something called neutron transmutation doped germanium uh, uh, thermistor, and we also uh, glue a, a heater onto the crystal to provide calibration. And then we cool the crystal down to the temperatures of about 10 uh, hundreds of a degree above absolute zero, at those small temperatures, the heat capacity of the material becomes so small that one can actually measure energy deposited by fundamental particles by measuring temperature rise. So uh, we look at the temperature measured by this thermistor, amplitude of its uh, temperature signal is proportional to energy, um, and we look for temperature fluctuations of the order of 100 micro Kelvin for each MeV of energy deposit. And in this nuclear process, the typical energy deposit is about two and a half MeV. There's extremely slow uh, signals. This energy then slowly leaks out of the detector um, into the uh, heat bus. Uh, the detectors are cooled by a refrigerator, so the refrigerator will slowly cool the crystal back down over the time scales of about a second. So these experiments require uh, very small backgrounds. They typically operate underground where they're not disturbed by human activity, or even more importantly, they're not disturbed by cosmic rays. Uh, we take these crystals, we arrange them in towers, connecting the towers to a state-of-the-art refrigerating system that can cool them to the temperatures about 10 millikel, and then we just sit and wait. Uh, graduate students write code uh, to look at the distribution of pulse heights, and then we focus on the region of interest here around the uh, magic energy, the decay energy of the tellurium-130 that happens to be at 2528 uh, kilo electron volts, and we look for a peak in the spectrum. This was done before by an experiment called Coricino, uh, Coricino stands for small heart in Italian. This was a smaller prototype of a bigger detector. And we look for a peak above the continuous background in this region of interest, and they didn't see any peaks. So the fact that they didn't see any peaks let them set a limit 
on the rate of the survey process. I'll come back to that. So uh, query is uh, a step in a relatively long program of about 25 years or so uh, of development of tellurium dioxide crystals that started from tiny modules and has graduated now to a ton scale detector. Um, in the past, the development followed the Moore's curve, but of course, Moore's law sometimes has to be modified by finding realities, and so yes, graduate students complain. Uh, so quarry will be the next step in this process that will assemble about a ton of the uh, material and we hope to start operating early next year. Quarry is a, uh, will be an array of about 1,000 crystals, 988 to be precise, placed in, in, inside a custom dilution, a custom cryostat cooled by a state-of-the-art dilution refrigerator to the temperature of about 10 millikelvin. Uh, the total mass of the detector is about 750 kilograms. So 200 kilograms of that is in the right isotope tellurium-130. Uh, it's an experiment that's jointly done by Italy and the US and operated in the Italian uh, Apennines uh, in Italy in Gran Sasso National Lab. And we hope to start operating early next year. This volume is the coldest cubic meter in the universe, as I will tell you. So the experiment runs uh, in Italy. It's a collaboration. It's run by a collaboration of about 100 physicists, about 30 Americans, about 60 Italians. That is up to 90, give or take, um, of uh, probably about a dozen institutions. Uh, we get together every couple of years in this beautiful uh, town of Assurgi in Italy. Um, it's about two hours away from Rome, going east. Uh, if you are in the neighborhood, stop by, we'll give you a tour. Uh, the experiment is uh, located in the Grand Sasso National Lab, which was built off of the side of a highway tunnel, uh, dug onto the tallest mountain on the Italian peninsula. So this tallest mountain, or about a kilometer of rock above the experimental holes, protects the sensitive experiments from the cosmic rays that would otherwise swamp the tiny signals we are looking for. Uh, we are not the deepest uh, site in the world, uh, well, but I would argue probably the prettiest. Uh, they, what we know about the experiment uh, is based on the little heart Coricino, the experiment that operated a single tower uh, in an older cryostat with about 11 kilograms of tellurium-130. Coricino looked for this process uh, they looked at, in this region, at 2530 <coughs> 20, uh, kilo electron volts, and they observed no peak. So don't let this red line and green line fool you. These are uh, the example of a peak, how the peak would have looked uh, if the rate of the process or the lifetime of the process were 2.8 times 10 to the 24 years. So the absence of the peak lets Coricino set a limit on the effect of neutrino mass at about three to 700 uh, milli electron volts. So now uh, the more important aspect of Coricino is that lets us design, it let us exper uh, gain experience with the operation of these detectors and let us design a better experiment that Cori will be. In particular, we look at the backgrounds produced by natural radioactivity uh, near the detectors and we can classify them into four, uh, three different groups. One is the gamma rays produced by contamination, very small contamination in the detector and in the cryostat. <clears throat> For example, you know, a single human sitting inside the cryostat would probably produce a background even larger than this. So small amount of contamination of sodium in the cryogenic volumes produces the background near the region where we're looking for this blue line. Most of the background, as it turns out, actually comes from the small amount of uranium and small amount of sodium on the surfaces near the detector, where the alpha decays of uranium and sodium can uh, deposit energy uh, near the detector and near, and near the region of interest. And this is what dominates uh, the background rate in quarry. So uh, quarry Chino and, uh, and let us study the properties of these backgrounds in great detail. And so we designed quarry 
with the goal of uh, eliminating or reducing most of this background. In particular, Quarry is a much larger detector. It will have about 19 towers as opposed to one. Uh, we assembled the entire detector in the state of the clean room in such a way that this radioactive contamination in the surfaces doesn't pose as much of a problem. So let me actually show you the main uh, features of the detector. Uh, we, in fact, operated the first of the towers. We assembled 20 towers already, and we operated one of them for about two years, and we called it Cori Zero. We count starting from zero, like C programmers. Um, it was a single tower of 52 crystals with the mass of about 11 kilograms of tellurium one thirty. Its purpose, its primary purpose, was to actually learn how to build these detectors cleanly. We build these detectors in a state-of-the-art clean room uh, on top of the second-story uh, building in the quarry hut. Uh, the operation is done in multiple stages. Everything is assembled inside the nitrogen-filled glove box so that the detectors are never exposed to natural air, which can be full of radon. Uh, at the levels that would harm the detector. So human hands uh, only touch the detectors uh, inside the gloves. So here's an example of human hands assembling the detector inside the glove boxes. Uh, we attach uh, these uh, sensors using a robotic system also that's so-called anthropomorphic robot that picks these crystals up and then very carefully places them with the precision of about five microns on top of the sensor to which the glue dots have already been applied uh, by another semi-automated robotic system. Uh, and then we wait five minutes for the uh, glue to cure and then place the detector into the, back into the assembly line. The entire detectors, as I mentioned, are assembled inside the nitrogen-filled glove boxes. And then we wire the sensors with 25 micron thick gold wires is about four gold wires per sensor. So this was done uh, very carefully by our personnel. In fact, in Cori Zero, we lost one of the sensors and one of the heaters. We learned how to do the assembly more carefully. And in fact, our guys now have assembled the entire thousand crystal set without any losses. Uh, our personnel, our Berkeley personnel, played a very uh, important role in this. Uh, this is a picture of Tommy O'Donnell, who's now in Italy, um, actually inspecting all of our towers, wire bonding these tiny little sensors with the 25 micron gold wires to a readout strip that runs along uh, the detector. And if you don't think that this was challenging enough, the equipment was designed for right-handed people, and Tommy happens to be left-handed. So the poor guy wired about 500 crystals with his not subdominant hand, uh, and they all operate uh, beautifully. So this is the entire tower, Cori Zero. It was assembled, placed uh, in the nitrogen uh, storage box before being installed in the detector. So we have 19 of the storage boxes in our clean room now. There are three of them. I don't know if this reminds you of anything. When I looked at, it, at this picture first, it reminded me of this picture. So clearly, Cori is poised to take over the world. Uh, we now have all of the towers assembled. The first tower was assembled in the Cori clean room and then had to be transported by this high-tech device over into the next hall where the cast that was located. Graduate students were holding their breath for about half an hour. Uh, this process went without a hitch, and then we operated the single tower for about two years in the Coricina cryost that next door. Uh, we took data for about two years, as I mentioned. Our data taken is split into normal physics mode. These are blue regions uh, in time. And calibrations, we take about three days of calibration data every month or so. Uh, and so uh, over uh, two years, we accumulated roughly about a year worth of ca one calendar year worth of physics data. Uh, as I mentioned, we take calibration data once uh, a month for about three days, and we can look at how the detector performs based on this calibration data. So these peaks in the calibration spectrum are produced by natural radioactivity from sodium decay, and we study them in great detail. In fact, we can compare the energy reconstructed by our detector 
to the energy to a known energy from this radioactive source. This is the energy produced by a thallium 208 decay. And we understand the structure of this line shape through about four orders of magnitude. In particular, we can even see very small effects, like the small fraction of events where the excitation, atomic excitation X-rays escape a single crystal and deposit energy into somewhere nearby. Uh, so uh, these small effects that happen about once for every thousand degrees can be seen by this detector with relatively good precision. We demonstrate that our energy resolution of this detector uh, has been improved compared to the previous experiments. So we can measure energy of, radio of these radioactive processes with the precision of about five kilo electron volts. More importantly, we look at the uh, rate of uh, radioactive contamination in the region of interest near uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> near our region of interest here, near the region of 2,500 uh, uh, kilo electron volts, and we notice that the backgrounds primarily produced by alpha contamination by the case of uranium and sodium chain has been reduced compared to the previous experiments by at least a factor of six. So this is primarily due to very careful handling of the detectors and assembly techniques that we have developed over the last five years or so. So uh, we then uh, take uh, physics data, we show that our backgrounds near the region of interest in Core Zero are well understood. They're primarily explained by small amounts of residual radioactive contamination uh, in the old Korichina cryostat. Uh, so we see it uh, here in this energy region where most of our background is dominated by the Compton tail produced by this uh, uh, <coughs> gamma events from thallium so decays. So then we accumulated data for two years and we looked uh, in the region where we would expect the double beta decay to occur for a peak in the uh, spectrum, we saw no peak. We saw a peak uh, to the left of it that comes from uh, the nature of radioactivity from cobalt 60 decays. In the region where we would expect to see a peak, there was none, or we were hoping to see a peak, there was none. Uh, this red curve shows how large the peak would have been if the lifetime of the double beta decay was 2.7 times 10 to 24 years. And so the absence of the peak let us set the half-life limit on this process at this level. We then combine our data uh, with the previous experiment called Kovicina, uh, and we set some of the most stringent constraints on this process at, level, at the level of about four times 10 to 24 years. But even more importantly, we let our graduate students actually escape Berkeley. And so, for example, John Wallet graduated last May with a degree, uh, <clears throat> and he was one of the uh, primary analysts of uh, this experiment. Core Zero already sets uh, significant constraints on neutrino mass in the range of about 300 to 800 milli electron volts, and they're quite competitive with the rest of the double beta decay family, uh, and Core, in fact, hopes to improve this uh, sensitivity by another order of magnitude, at least. So now that we know how to assemble detectors, we assembled one power, Next step in the process is to assemble 19, and we have done that too. So yet another step is now to take these 19 towers, place them inside the custom cryostat. We have built the cryostat already, and we're in the process of final tests with this cryostat, um, and then take data. And our quarry zero experience points out that uh, we expect great things from the quarry when it starts operating early next year. But of course, the state of the art, the heart of this experiment, and again, pun somewhat intended, is this dilution refrigerator and the cryostat that, that it cools down. It's a uh, state-of-the-art device. It's filled with material. It's about 20 tons of different materials cooled down to various cryogenic temperatures. About six tons of the material, including lead picked up from a old sunken Roman ship, um, it's cooled down to the temperatures about 50 to 10, 10 to 50 millikelvin. The volume where the detector would see it is in fact the volume of about cubic meter. So somewhat as a bet, uh, you know, this is my fault. I bet a bottle of nice Italian wine, Marina Cvetic, 
multiple channel da Bruzzo to John to prove his claim at the time that Corey will be or is the coldest cubic meter in the known universe when it operates. Uh, the detector has operated. We, in fact, celebrated the fact that this volume of uh, cubic meter has reached the temperature of about 6 millikelvin or so. And uh, John has uh, posted or published the proof in an archive article. So as it turns out, uh, that generated some publicity for the experiment. As it turns out, the fact that we have a coldest cubic meter in the universe uh, was interesting to the public. Um, they, uh, so there was, you know, even Huffington Post articles were published, you know, the great achievement. Uh, you know, some articles were sort of uh, less precise scientifically than others. This is probably a translation from English to Hindu back to English that claims that we could a copper cubed of a cubic meter volume. Uh, that's not quite right. Um, I'm actually glad that even my home country joined into the uh, publicity phrase, so there's a description of a Russian article. Uh, I mentioned that one of the interesting things about Quarry is that we use very low activity uh, lead, and the lowest activity lead you can get, it turns out, sits on the bottom of the ocean. So the Italian Ministry of Culture allowed Quarry physicists to dive down near the bottom of the sea, or at the bottom of the sea near Sardinia, and fish out about uh, 10 metric tons of old ancient lead from a uh, old uh, ship. And so then we very carefully cut off the insignia on the top of it, gave it back to the museums, and then melted the rest for the benefits of science. So now this lead sits and protects our sensitive detector volume uh, from radioactive contamination of the rock around the detector. So Quarry now is ready to take data, almost ready to take data. Uh, all of the detectors are now assembled, uh, most of them by Berkeley personnel. Um, and we hope to start operating uh, early next year. So when we start, so, you know, from year two or two years after Quarry Zero started, we hope to turn on very quickly, and in about uh, three months or so, we'll pass all the previous experiments that looked for neutrinos, double beta decay, and tellurium. Uh, and in about five years, we'll reach the sensitivity to the neutrino mass that will range, depending on what nuclear theorists tell us, somewhere between 40 milli electron volts to about 100 milli electron volts or so. Now, if I have a few more minutes, given that we started a little late, I'll tell you what happens if you don't discover double beta decay in these next five years. Well, what happens is easy, uh, Sachi and Alexei will graduate. Um, however, uh, we would want to know whether this process will occur at even more rare rates than what Corey can achieve. And so the experiment that we're trying to build after Quarry operates is called Cupid. You notice there's a pattern here, right? Uh, Cupid, uh, well, let me come back to this slide. Uh, Cupid stands for Quarry Upgrade with Particle ID. It's an acronym wrapped into an acronym. Uh, it's a very romantic name, clearly. Um, it's based on the idea of the same idea as Quarry. We'll uh, operate, hopefully, in the same cryostat. We'll have about a ton of material, uh, but it will try to improve on the quarry sensitivity by using additional detectors. By trying to eliminate most of the background produced in an experiment like quarry by operating a second bolometer next to the main tellurium dioxide crystal and trying to see faint luminescence produced by electrons from the double beta decay. So this is the idea that you know, two sensors are better than one. Uh, that you can try to identify most of the events that contaminate our uh, region of interest by observing light that the two electrons would produce. Most of our backgrounds come from the alpha particles and they will not produce light or nearly as much light compared to electrons. So we are now thinking about building detectors like this. We are operating uh, test uh, facilities here on Berkeley campus, in fact, next door, 75 LeConte. Uh, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, Cupid now is a uh, group of about 150 scientists from all over the world that are getting together to try to design the experiment. And we hope to build it probably starting about five years from now. Uh, here at Berkeley, uh, we are contributing to this process by designing and operating 
and debugging the state of the art sensors known as transition edge sensors. These are similar to the devices used to observe faint cosmic microwave background signals or to look for dark matter in an experiment like CDMS. We are improving on that design by operating these devices at the temperatures that have never been actually uh, used before, the temperatures below 15 millikelvin or so. And we are hoping in the next few years to build the prototypes of these devices and actually demonstrate that they can reduce the backgrounds even below the levels that will be observable in uh, Quarry. And if that all works, uh, we'll operate this detector probably starting in about 2023 or so. And after that, we'll be sensitive to neutrino masses in the range of about few to about 15 milli electron volts or so. Uh, and that is sufficient to make a definitive statement about the nature of neutrinos if neutrinos happen to be Majorana particles and if the nature is kind to us and the ordering of neutrino masses is so-called inverted. Even if the nature isn't kind to us and the ordering of neutrino masses is normal, you'll still be able to improve the sensitivity of the present experiments by more than an order of magnitude. And that will give us another order of magnitude in potential discoveries. So uh, I hope that uh, if, you know, there's been about 13 years since my previous colloquium. So uh, 13 years from now, I hope to stand up uh, here and tell you something exciting about this field again, about the discoveries made both by Corey and or Cupid. Uh, but before I do that, let me thank uh, my colleagues, in particular the group uh, from Berkeley and LBNL, uh, that is making uh, extremely important key contributions to this great process. So let me stop here and see if you have any questions. <clears throat> oh, all right, in the back first, and, and then John. Thank you. Uh, why is the engine led has lower radioactivity? Well, actually, it's a very interesting question. There are two answers to that. One is, as it turns out, for reasons nobody quite understands, uh, ancient Romans were very good at removing uranium from their lab. Uh, much better than actually modern process. So as it turns out, the actual contamination in uranium and sodium that lives for 10 billion years is smaller in the ancient lab than in the modern process. We don't quite understand this. You can get a lower activity lab, but it's a very complicated process. So that's answer number one. Romans were good. And so number two is that uh, lead can be uh, some uh, uh, relatively fast decaying isotopes of lead can be produced in lead by bombardment of by cosmic micro uh, by cosmic radiation by muons uh, and neutrons. So uh, some isotopes of lead are actually dangerous for this experiment as well. Are produced by cosmic rays and the lead that sat on the bottom of the ocean for 2,000 years didn't have those isotopes produced. So we actually get uh, two benefits of using that Roman lead for the price of one, well, for the price of a bunch of dives to the bottom of the sea, low uranium and sodium activity and low cosmogenic activation. Uh, as it turns out, uh, this uh, Roman lead is actually expensive. That fact that lead uh, 210 <coughs> and to, uh, is relatively rare and it is good for semiconductor industry. So uh, it's actually, uh, as it turns out, is a high commodity or is a hot commodity. John, did you? Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad to say that Cupid will use uh, GPS. Mm -hmm. But why did it take so long? Yeah, um, yeah, the question, yeah, the question is that why did it take us so long to realize that these are great devices? And in fact, so to realize that devices that you invented, squids, are. Uh, uh, necessary to, well, and the great devices to amplify the small signals. I think the main reason is just being conservative and it takes uh, so long to develop techniques for clean production, for ultra radio pure operation that uh, we so far stuck with the devices we knew well. Uh, the, as some of our graduate students would point out, it takes sometimes decades to develop this technology and I guess grad students are not as patient. So we build these experiments in stages and using the older technology first and introducing it for the next experiment later. And thankfully you and CMB experiments 
And dark matter experiments have perfected this technology for us for now, so we can take advantage of that. That's correct. Right, so uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, so we use, so also, you know, some healthy amount of uh, conservatism is good in this business. Um, so we use at this point the largest crystals that the uh, manufacturer can possibly grow. We grow them in China, and this is actually the best facility that we found. Uh, and they come out in, uh, in bulls that are about this big, so that basically depends on the size of the crucible they can grow. And then we cut away the inner two inch by two inch by two inch crystal out of that, which is most radio pure. Usually, crystal growing process tends to push contaminants, including radioactive contaminants, to, to the surface of the bowl, so we get the most pristine part. Uh, we could probably increase the size of the crystal maybe by 20% or so, so six centimeters, but ultimately the gain is significant in terms of the contaminants in the surface. Nobody has been able to grow, I mean, ideally, grow a you know, real cubic meter, that would be great. Uh, but uh, we are limited by technology. On the other hand, segmentation sometimes is good too. You can actually look for events where you deposit energy in multiple crystals. For example, for a gamma ray that comes in from outside, scatters once, and deposits roughly the right amount of energy in one of the crystals. So this segmentation allows us to eliminate background signals. So it's sort of a intersectionalization problem. Yes. So, 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 so some of the so some of this new technology that we are going for for Cupid involves crystals that use use a crystal license of course not more important way that would that would where where the energy would in the crystal would produce light and would also and also produce heat. So we would so measure, measure heat deposit by by the sensor. sensor. Yeah, the current yeah, generation, generation is don't don't do my sense of measurement. Sense of measurement. measurement. And so you very wise like, like you use you just to just the state of the action and part of the contribution to them to them. Oh, that oh, the way to do things in the I see. So, so uh, about five ways to do the way to do things. Well, it's fair. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Slide, slide. Some of them are in fact, some of our other kind of noise use light, light to detect uh, the uh, energy process. So, for example, if you use a liquid synthesis, you could scintillate and like produce use a lot of light, light to be speaking, and you can detect that amount of light and measure energy. Typically, you don't make as many photons as you make photons. So these experiments are limited in energy. They can still look for a peak. Uh, it's just the size of the bits of the peak is much larger, so they have to work significantly harder on making the experiment more pure. Now there's a... Uh, <coughs> So that's the disadvantage of these experiments. The advantage of these experiments is that they use liquids, and liquids you can continuously purify. So these experiments are naturally more pure, but have a more poor energy resolution. Our detectors are more precise, but maybe a little bit dirtier. So there's a nice complementarity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 